Good morning, church. It's good to see you all here this morning. It's always good to be here. I enjoy getting to open the Word and walk through it together with you. And um, it's something about the whole context of a letter. We're in Colossians. Uh, we, the theme of this letter is rooted in Christ. And we've been just spending a little bit of time going through it. And, and I like that approach because we get the feel for the, the purpose for which it was written, who it was written to, what's going on. And, and I think we just grab some deeper truths by doing that way versus just jumping into a, one of the stories in the Bible. And so we, we're in this book study of Colossians, and it's called Rooted in Christ. And the idea is just like a tree this planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. Sorry, the ADHD kicked in for a second, but just like a tree that's planted by water, its roots go deep, and, and it's what gives it the strength to withstand the storms of life and the, and the winds of doctrine. Uh, it's what keeps us grounded and stable in our faith, and it's so um, important. Paul writes this letter to a church at Colossae to deal with some heresies that are creeping in to the church. And so we've been walking through that. Um, and the title of the message this morning is Avoiding Religious Pitfalls. I got a question for you before we get started. Any gamers in the house? Raise your hand. You like gaming? All right. So not as many, but man, I tell you what, back in 1982, I think the whole world were gamers. Um, I remember it vividly. I was a little bitty guy when cable came to our house. You remember the TVs that had the channel 13 and that was it? The little cable box had buttons and you'd go up to like 50. It was awesome. And then I had this Atari 2600. If anyone has one of those, you want to loan it to me so I can have a little nostalgia, please just touch base with me after church. But my grandma bought one of those Atari gaming systems for each of the grandkids, and it so began this addiction uh, for not only me, but many adults all across the globe of sitting down in front of a TV with a gaming console and playing their favorite games. Anybody want to guess what the number one game was for years? Pac-Man, y'all, Pac-Man. And you would try forever to figure out the sequence, the system, the, you know, whatever, the, pa the pattern in order to beat Pac-Man. I really didn't care much for Pac-Man. I like Donkey Kong and Centipede and Dig Dug. But my favorite one came a, a few years later. It was 1982, I think, whenever this one came out. But some guys that worked for Atari weren't getting the recommend, or I guess the, uh, the attention they needed to get or the, uh, for, for building the games, the designers. And they go to Atari and they say, hey, listen, would you, you know, we feel like we need to make more money and or maybe mention our name in the credits. And they're like, no, you're not any more important than the guys that are packing the boxes. And they're like, Pfft. Okay, and so they left, started a new company called Activision. They called it Activision because it came before Atari in the dictionary, right? So Activision, and it's called the, the Fabulous Four, and they began working on this game, and this, this game would be the number two game for years. Over four million units uh, sold. It was in households everywhere, and it was uh, the main thing that I did as a little kid for hours. Anybody want to take a guess what that one is? The title kind of gives it away. Pitfall. Uh, this... Pitfall game where you became, uh, you know, one with little Pitfall Harry and you would help him navigate the jungle and you tried to avoid the quicksand or the, the little ponds or the crocodiles and you'd jump on a rope and swing across and then the, the little digital reference to Tarzan would play as he swing across the crocodile. And you'd avoid the logs that were rolling, the centipedes and all these different traps navigating through the jungle trying to get as many of the treasures you could um, before you ended the game, you had like 20 minute time limit, three lives, 2,000 points, and it was a lot of fun. And the objective of that game was to reach the end, collecting as many treasures as possible without falling into the pitfalls that were scattered throughout the jungle. Shane, why are you talking about video games? And why are you talking about pitfall? If you think about it for just a second, religion is sometimes a lot like that game pitfall. Think about it, we're on this journey. Sometimes there's these traditions, these rules, and these rituals, and the goal in our life is to navigate the spiritual journey seeking treasure. And by treasure, I don't mean the riches of this world, but uh, the treasure that is in Christ, right? And that we understand who he is, and we're growing, and we're established in him. And so religion can sometimes feel like that pitfall game with the traditions, the rituals, the rules, and we're just trying to make it through um, and growing in our faith. However, just like that game of pitfall, there are some spiritual pitfalls that we must avoid to stay on course. That's the heart behind what I feel like the Apostle Paul is getting at now in this section of the letter. Um, he writes this letter to encourage a church that he didn't plant. He's in prison, um, but he had gone on a missionary journey to Ephesus, and he preached the gospel. Many, many lives were changed. The church was born. But there's a man named Epaphras there that possibly is the one that planted the church at Colossae. 
So Epaphras hears the gospel, he responds, he goes back to his hometown, preaches the gospel of Christ, many people's lives are changed, the church is born. So Paul has never been there, he don't know the people, he didn't plant the church, but he's writing them a letter. He's writing a letter because Epaphras brought to Paul some concerns. Hey, this church, their, their faith was strong, everything's going great, but man, there's some things creeping in. There's some concerns I have as pastor here that there's some heresies that are, that are making their way into the church because this church was born in the context of the Jewish religion and law. And so there's this fight for years of all these different isms that were creeping into the church. And so Paul sits down and he writes this uh, beautiful letter. I, I think one of the biggest defenses of the supremacy of Christ in all of Scripture is found in um, Colossians. And so uh, that's the theme behind this. I feel like he's, he's encouraging uh, them to stay in their, 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 their following Christ. They started there to stay, continuing following him. But also he changes his tone to more of a polemic style of speech, which is very critical and like in your face, calling to task some of these heresies. Um, and in that, he's warning us of a couple of pitfalls to avoid. Now, just to remind you, there's several things going on. It's just a conglomerate of a bunch of heresy. Uh, it's the beginning of Gnosticism. There's some, some mysticism. There's legalism. There's humanism. There's asceticism, which is the extreme self-denial. Paul is like, man, there's a lot of stuff packed into this thing. And you need to be careful. You need to watch out for the pitfall. So let's read the text. And then after that, I'll pray and we'll jump right in if that's okay. Okay, just checking. I, I, I'm just making sure. Chapter 2, verse 6, read with me. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking or from the spiritual powers of this world, rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body, so you are also complete through your union with Christ, who is the head of every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Verse 13, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us, took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So don't let anyone judge you, condemn you for what you eat or drink, or for not celebrating certain holy days, or for new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial and the worship of angels saying that they've had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud and they're not connected to Christ, the head of the body. For he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments and it grows as God nourishes it. You have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world such as Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Would you pray with me? Father, this is your word, and we know that your word is where the power is at. We know that your word is alive, active, and it has... Lord, the the ability, if applied, to just radically change our lives. And so I pray that we today would have open hearts, open minds, to receive whatever you have for us today. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for loving us enough to give us your word. We pray that you would just be honored today as we just kind of walk through it, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul begins in verse 6 with this exhortation to a young church to continue in Christ. He says it like this. 
And now, just as you have accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Um, When you take over traditions back in the day, it was done orally. It was the teachings. And so they had the teachings of Moses, and they had the oral teachings of the Jewish law that they would just pass down from generation to generation. They would tell you, this is what the law says, don't do it. The oral teachings there. And there's also uh, the traditions of man that were also passed along word of mouth, orally. Like, hey, this is what we do, this is what we don't do. And so all of this teaching was heard by the hearers, and it's what they kind of lined their lives up to. Paul saying, when you heard this good news about Jesus, uh, when, when the uh, Epaphras came back and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, you heard it and you received it then, Right? And so what he's saying is your, your, your walk with Christ commenced at the beginning with faith. You believed what you heard about Jesus. And he's saying just as you believed that way, you began that way, you received Christ at the beginning, so you must continue to follow him. Say him. So Paul's going to make this clear. He's like, listen, guys, it's all about Jesus. In fact, that's, if there's a theme in this whole letter, it's all about Jesus, the sufficiency, the supremacy of Christ and Christ alone. Jesus plus nothing. He's like, man, you believed at the beginning this good news of Jesus, and you placed your faith in what you heard. You need to continue in that, right? And when you do that, he says, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him the solid rock, right? Um, Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. What truth? The truth about Jesus. Church, you can help me out. You can talk back. The truth about Jesus is good news, right? You were taught that, so let them, you're going to grow strong in the truth that you were taught about Jesus, and the the, the, um, product of that is going to be you will overflow with thankfulness, you know, something to just consider for a moment when you think about what he's done for us. The fact that it's something that we couldn't do on our own, that Jesus paid it all. He made it possible. Should we not be overflowing with thankfulness this morning? I'm glad a handful of you got that. Because the reality is we should all be extremely grateful for what we have and who we are in Christ, what he's done for us. So he begins by exhorting them to continue in their faith. Now, this is a continuation of an argument that Paul started back in chapter 1, verse 15. You remember that, that he is the image of the invisible God. He, he begins this, 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 I guess, exaltation of Christ and his worthiness of, of being supreme over everything. Why? Because in him, in Christ, are found reconciliation to God. How are we made right with God? God reconciled us through Jesus. Amen. So we find reconciliation to God. The revelation of the mystery was found in Christ. For centuries, they only had part of the story. But then Paul was saying, hey, listen, I'm going to give you the mystery. That is that Christ is the, the, the big picture. He's the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. It's found in Christ. He says the believer's perfection is found in Christ. Our completeness is found in Christ. The believer's education or wisdom is also found in Christ. And because of that, that in Christ we have everything, you need to continue to live in him. And that's where he's at in this. And so this is his exhortation. And then he shifts his tone where he's exhorting the church. But then it's almost as though he knows names of some of these guys that are bringing the heresies into the church. But he's not calling them by name. But the people that were reading this letter would get it pretty quickly. They were like, oh, I know who he's talking about. But he's taking to task some of these isms, these heresies that are creeping into the church, and he sternly, sharply rebukes some of these teachings that are held there. And so you can just almost hear it in his tone. Verse 8, don't let anyone capture you, spoil you, take you captive. Don't let anyone capture you. The idea behind that is through deception, like you set a snare, a trap, that you camouflage it to make it look good, make it look real and safe, but the unsuspected person walks by and they're ensnared, they're trapped, and the picture is like you capture somebody and you carry them off as plunder. And Paul's saying, listen, don't let anyone do that to you. Don't let anyone set a trap for you that would be a pitfall in your faith. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. 
So the first pitfall that Paul is addressing is this empty philosophy. Now, I would say this before I go into it is Christianity has always been in danger, always been in danger of falling into one of these two pitfalls. Either it's the humanism, it's the human philosophy where we, we so water down the work of Christ and we add to it. Uh, that's a, a dangerous pitfall in our, in our journey of faith. And the other one would be ritual or legalism. And Christianity has always been in danger of falling into those two. And so could you imagine that pitfall game playing it with a blindfold on, right? So Paul's essentially saying, hey, like, guys, you need to have your eyes open. You need to be aware of this and avoid falling into these pitfalls in your journey of Faith. Christ is the answer to philosophy, and he's the answer to ritual. One deals with the head, one deals with the heart. Paul's saying it's all in Christ, and Jesus plus nothing. Okay? So the first one he addresses is this empty philosophy. Now, notice that he's not saying uh, that we shouldn't pursue philosophy. The word philosophy is two words, philo, which means love, and sophia, which means anybody? Wisdom. Wisdom. So philosophy is the love of wisdom, the pursuit of wisdom. And Paul's not saying that we should not pursue wisdom. In fact, just read the Proverbs. Solomon, the wisest person who ever lived, wrote this letter to his son, and he talks a lot about wisdom, the need for us to, to go after it, and the benefit of having wisdom. In fact, Proverbs 16, 16 says, How much better to get wisdom than silver and gold? In Proverbs chapter 4, listen to what he says about wisdom. He says, get wisdom, develop good judgment, don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will place a lovely wreath on your head. She will present you with a beautiful crown. I think it's safe to say that the Apostle Paul is not saying that we should not pursue wisdom. Okay? Are you following me so far? What he's saying is that the pitfall is not wisdom philosophy, the love of wisdom in and of itself, but he uses a key word. He says empty philosophies. Now, the word empty there is a picture of a a container that's bone dry. Imagine you're working out in the heat of the day. You're like, man, I just need some cold, refreshing water. Somebody brings to you a beautiful glass. You're like, that's a pretty glass. And you look in it and it's bone dry. It's useless, right? That's what that word empty means. It's to to walk away empty-handed. He said, this is the pitfall. This empty philosophy is what we as Christians should avoid. He says they're high-sounding nonsense is what he calls it. They, they have these convincing stories they try to convince us of. He says it's empty. It has no value. It's devoid of any help at all. It certainly doesn't meet any needs. And so he says this is what we are to avoid. This is the pitfall that we are to avoid. Now, what makes it an empty philosophy? Notice it says where it or, the origins, origins are of it. It says they come from human thinking. We can come up with some really crazy stuff, can't we? As humans, and you can get some people that are very smart. I'm not one of them, by the way, but very smart people that can come up with some really off-the-wall crazy stuff. You're like, where did you get that at? Did you eat pizza last night? You had like a terrible dream. I mean, how did you come up with that? And you get these guys that have high-sounding arguments. They come from human thinking. Just a reminder, the Bible says that the wisdom of man is foolishness to God. And so he's like, this pitfall is when we accept this empty philosophy that come from human thinking, it's a pitfall that we should avoid in our faith. And he also says, and from spiritual powers of this world. That's what the New Living Translation says. I don't like that in this um, area because I I feel like it makes us think, what are the spiritual powers? We're talking about the devil and his demons? No. The King James says the rudiments of the world. Uh, NASB says the elemental principles. And I'd like to think that um, it's a little simpler than that because he alludes to it later in in the rest of the text. So what is a rudiment of the world? It simply means fundamental elementary concepts. It's the elementary stages of any subject. Webster's defines it as a mere beginning, first slight appearance, or underdeveloped or imperfect form of something. Think of a shadow. That's what Paul's going to use in a moment is a shadow. He's like, these things are like elemental in that. Think of the law. The law of Moses was given, not that they could completely follow it, because the Bible says no one will ever be made righteous by following the law. But the law was given to point out to us our brokenness and our need for a Messiah. Amen? 
So the law could never make us right with God, but it was given to us. It was important. It played a role, but it was only a shadow, if you will, a foreshadowing of a reality that would come later. Anyone, anyone want to guess what the reality that comes later is? It's easy. I've been talking about him for weeks. Christ. He's like, these empty philosophies, they come from these crazy things and human thinking that they conjure up, but they also come from these rudimental things of the world, these elementary things. And if you look at uh, verse 18, when he talks about, don't let anybody condemn you, um, or back up to verse 16, don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink. These are these elemental principles that were the ceremonial law, the dietary law, the moral law, the civil law, all these laws, the do's and the don'ts of Leviticus. These are all the things that they were, you know, trying their best to stay true to, following the laws, obeying the laws. And he says, those are elementary, man. That's old school stuff. That's Old Testament stuff. It had a purpose. But that's what I think he's talking about when he talks about the rudiments of the world. He says, celebrating certain holy days or new ceremonies or Sabbaths. Verse 17, for these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And that reality is... Christ Jesus. I, I was thinking about this a moment ago, so bear with me. Paul also talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, about the, the old way, the old covenant, the law. He says, the old way with laws etched in stone led to death. Though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way? Now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? In the old way, which brings condemnation, if it was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? In fact, the first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? He's talking about the law, the old covenant, and he was saying it led to death. It led to condemnation. Are you grateful today for the new covenant? And so it's like these rudimentary Things of the world, these elemental principles, they were all foreshadowing. And, and, and Paul's deal was he's addressing with people who were coming in and saying, no, 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 no. It's, you're blaming in Christ, but you also have to do this. You also have to observe this. You can't eat that. You can't touch that. And so he's dealing with this empty philosophy that is rooted in human reasoning, whatever they could conjure up, and also in the basic principles that they grew up in, in the faith, the, the law. And so that's the first pitfall. And, and the reminder is we don't need those because verse 10 says, you also are complete. Say complete. So there's this empty philosophy. And notice the contrast there with what he says in verse 9. For in Christ lives all the fullness. Say fullness. So like you get this empty philosophy here like this it has no value it's of no good to us and he says on the other hand you've got the fullness of God that is in Christ Jesus all the fullness is in him and you believers are complete lacking nothing got it all in Jesus you are complete through your union with Christ who is the head of the church aren't you grateful today that we are complete in Christ and so we're on this journey through the jungle, we're avoiding the quicksand and the crocodiles and the pitfalls, the pitfall of human philosophy. Uh, the second one uh, that I want to hit on a moment, I, I know we don't see this today in church anymore, but it's legalism. I say that with a smile on my face because we absolutely see it in churches today, don't we? And just in my lifetime, I remember growing up in churches that, oh man, it was, uh, there was more focus on the legalism things than what the scripture says. And I say that lightheartedly, but I mean, I, man, I, if I was smiling in church, I felt like it was, you know, irreverent. If I was chewing gum in church, I might be going to hell. You de absolutely didn't hold a hand of a girl that you liked uh, in the back of the, because God saw it, even though mom and dad might not. Women didn't wear pants. They wore dresses. Uh, they weren't wearing makeup in the church. I grew up in. I said in the first service and I got rebuked, but some of them needed to wear it. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. They didn't wear underarm deodorant, perfumes. Those were man-made. I'm like, time out. We're wearing clothes, right? But all this legal, and, and by the way, what legalism is, it's not the black and white stuff that scripture lays out. There are things in scripture that are absolute. 
right? God said it, and we need to stand with authority on those things that God says. But there are areas that are not absolutely clear, right? And, and I like to call it the black and white and the grace, right? The gray area in the middle. And it's in those gray areas that we have our own personal convictions. And my convictions may not be your convictions. But when I take my conviction and say, you're not right with God unless you do what I'm convicted about, that is legalism. Are you following me? And some of you have probably grown up in churches like that. I mean, uh, we've seen covenants signed that you won't touch any alcoholic drink. Um, and I'm not going to get on that one, but my scripture says um, it, that the sin was not in the drink but in the getting drunk, right? Um, it was like what you wear. It was what, even what Bible. I mean, I remember being rebuked heavily because I didn't read from the right Bible and here's the thing on that. It's like, it's like, hey, man, this is my conviction. It's what I'm going to read from, and I wish everybody would, but I'm not going to make you feel like you're sinning against God because you're not reading my version of the Bible. Does that make sense? So what's the best translation of the Bible you can read? The one that you will read. Now, I say that. There are some that are out there that I'm like, don't read that. That's kind of that's a dangerous one or whatever, but many of the translations are pretty solid translations, and the overall message is the same. And so let's, let's make sure that we don't get caught up in the legalism right there. So he's saying this is the other pitfall. It's the ritual. And for them, in that day, it was 100% circumcision. Now, if you were a Jew, Paul would say later, I was, I was circumcised on the eighth day. And this circumcision was a ritual that all Jewish boys had to go through, and it showed the covenant promise of God to Israel, right? And so what was happening is now Gentiles, who are not covenant people of God, are placing their faith in the gospel of Jesus. And there's this group of people called the Judaizers that are Christians, but they're Jewish Christians. They grew up in the law. And so they're, they're conflicted. They're like going, hey, man, wait a second. We all had to be circumcised. And so if you're going to be right with God, you too need to be circumcised. And so they were placing these rituals on other people. And Paul condemns that several different play, places. And so they, were, they believe that Levitical laws are still binding to all Christians. And so you must be circumcised. And so Paul um, is addressing this because these guys are starting to look at the ceremony as some sort of a magic charm. In fact, it got so bad that some of the rabbis would say, circumcised men do not descend to Gehenna. Uh, another place they would say, circumcision will save Israel from Gehenna. They put so much focus on the outward symbol, ritual, that they were completely missing the point entirely. And can I say that we can sometimes do the same things? Baptism is beautiful, and I believe that everybody needs to be baptized. But when we say that it is essential to salvation, now we're stepping over a line that, that kind of contradicts what Paul said. It is by grace you've been saved, this through faith, not by works, so that no man can boast about it. Amen? You can believe in Jesus, but you better be baptized too. You, you believe in Jesus, but you better go to confession every week. And so then the ritual becomes like the magic charms. Like, are you saved? Well, I got baptized when I was a kid. That's not what I ask you. I ask you if you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, are you saved? Right? I went forward one time during an altar call. I'm not asking you if you went forward during an altar call all the time. I'm asking you, are you actively trusting in Christ Jesus for salvation and him alone? Make sense? So Paul's saying, like, listen, you're, you're walking this journey. Don't fall into the pitfall of legalism, this ritual. And so uh, many people, I think, today, they, they, they're putting a lot of faith and hope in the ritual. They think the ritual equals salvation. And so I can live however I want to live as long as I go to confession on Saturday night. I can live however I want to live, as long as I was baptized, as long as I was in the right church, as long as just fill in the blank. And Jesus would have something to say about that mentality back then is he called them hypocrites, the Pharisees. He said, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. You look good on the outside, but inside you're filled with dead man's bones. See, God looks at the inside. He doesn't look at the ritual, the form. that's a foreshadow of what it means, right? He looks at the heart. In fact, let me just say this. Paul was so passionate about this and those that would try to enforce people into legalism. Listen to what he says in Philippians. Now, Philippians, that book of joy, right? Paul's also in prison. He's like, I've rejoiced in the Lord. I'll say it again, rejoice. Listen to what he says. Whatever happens to your brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs. Dogs, I would suggest to you, is not the family pet, Fido. Uh, dogs back in their day were scavengers. They were nasty. They would attack you. They might carry some diseases. And so Paul is saying, hey, man, be joyful in the Lord, but watch out for those dogs. Who are the dogs? Paul, that seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? Watch this. Those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. 
For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Right? And so he's like, these guys are dogs. Watch out for them. You're walking this journey of faith, and there's a pitfall there. They're trying to lure you into legalism. But can I just tell you what he says here in verse 11 is that when you came to Christ, you were, past tense, circumcised. But this circumcision was not a physical one done by human hands. It's done in the heart, the cutting away of the sinful nature. You've been, he, he mixes metaphors. We're told not to do that, but he mixes metaphors. You were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins, because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of your sins. Isn't that good news? So, The pitfalls that we should watch out for, the pitfall of legalism, the pitfall of human philosophy and human reasoning, um, they come from these rudimentary elements and all that stuff. He says, hey, watch out for those. So how do we avoid those? I think it's simple. We keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. It's all about Jesus. Jesus plus nothing. I need nothing else in order to be made right with God. It has all been accomplished on my behalf through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we call it good news, church. That's why we call it good news. Everything I need is in Jesus, so I keep my eyes on Jesus because in him are hidden all the treasures, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus is the prize. He is the goal. And so we continue in him. Can you remember when you first got saved? I think it's good for us to reflect on that, to go back, maybe a spiritual birthday. I have my physical birthday, but my spiritual birthday, when I gave my life to Christ, it is good for us to remember. It's good for us to go back and remember what it took at that moment. Did he ask you to jump through a bunch of hoops? Did he ask you to go like a hospital? You got to go get healed before you can go to the hospital to seek that help? No, he says, as you are, just as I am. I remember the song, just as I am. The invitation was there. Even though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them as white as snow. Whoever confesses Lord Jesus will be saved. That's good news, isn't it? And he says, just as you came to Christ, just as you received him in the first place, by faith, continue in that faith by building your faith on Jesus, letting your roots go deeper into Jesus. How do we do that? We read the Bible. We get to know him better. Uh, maybe you need to get involved in a Bible study. Like, I just want to know Jesus more. I want to know um, who I am and what he's done for me on my behalf. And just for uh, extra, just here it is. I'll put it out there. You know, when it comes to counterfeit money, the banks don't study the counterfeit bills. They just handle the real thing so much that when a counterfeit comes across their fingers, they know it's counterfeit. The same thing is true in our faith. It's like we know the word of God in such a way that when a counterfeit philosophy, human reasoning comes up, that somebody just came up in their sleep on their pizza stomachs or whatever it was, or this legalism, you can go, you know what? I think uh, that's a good sounding argument, but what about that you can take them back to scripture, amen? And you can say, that doesn't line up with the rest of scripture because my Bible says that everything was accomplished in Christ. Everything was accomplished in Christ. Jesus Paid it all. Amen? And I would say, lastly, stand in his victory. Stand in freedom. Let me read this and then I'll wrap it up. Verse 13. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive. Talking to Christians, those who place their faith in the gospel. He's made you alive with Christ for he forgave all. Say all. Past tense, when we place, he's like, appropriate what Christ did on the cross back then. He forgave all of your sins, past, future, and present. Verse 14, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In ancient Rome, when they would crucify a a criminal, they would many times post the offenses above that person that was crucified. So on a cross above their head would say thief, robber, whatever it may be that they were guilty of, to show you don't mess with Rome, right? We're going to crucify you. Here's what this guy did, and this is what it got him. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, they didn't have anything on him, no dirt on him, so all they could put in there was Jesus. This is the man, king of the Jews. But from God's perspective, I have a feeling he saw something else. Above that sign, maybe he saw the sign that was the sins of the entire world that were posted because the Bible says he knew him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we could be the righteousness of God. And God looked at the sins of all of mankind through the sacrifice of Jesus, and it says he took them away by nailing it to the cross. He, a better word is he blotted it out. 
Back in the day, they write on like papyrus and, and, and different things like that that were, uh, they didn't have acid in the ink, and so it was hard for it to be permanent, and it was easy for them just to kind of blot it out. I think of a dry erase marker board. And what he's saying is, when you came to Christ, here's what God did for you because of Christ. He canceled the record of the charges against you, and he took it away. He blotted it out by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed, listen to this, the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Back in the day when they would win a victory, they would make a big deal of it, big parade. It might last for a few days. One day they're running through with all the old equipment that belonged to the enemy. It's ours now. The next day, maybe they've got all the shields and the weapons that belong to the dead enemy that they just defeated. And like maybe the last day, the king would come through on his chariot and it was a big hula shaming of the enemies. And that's exactly what Paul says that Christ did when he came off of the cross, right? It says, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Church, that's good news. And the message that he has for the, the, the Christians at Colossae is the same one for us today. Listen, we begin in faith. We continue in faith. We don't need anything else other than Christ. We have everything we need in him. He is sufficient in all things. And so we stand in that victory. In Galatians, he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Are we free this morning? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He would go on to say, don't be ensnared again in the yoke of slavery. It is for freedom that we've been set free. Back in 1865, there's a little church in Baltimore called Monument Street Methodist Church. Pastor George Schrick had just finished a message. I don't know what the topic of the message was, but it evidently had an impact on one of the hearers there that day. And so it is said that as the pastor was wrapping it up with this lengthy prayer at the end of his sermon, there was a woman there in the choir loft now named Elvina Hall, and her mind was wondering, thinking about what possibly he had been preaching about. And so she grabs a hymnal, and she starts thumbing through it, and she finds a blank page, and then she writes down a poem that she came up with right then based on what she had been hearing. And it says this, I hear my Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Thou hast not my debt to pay, find in me thy all in all. Yea, nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's lamb. And now complete in him my robe, his righteousness. Close sheltered neath his side, I am divinely blessed. When from my dying bed my ransomed soul shall rise, Jesus paid it all shall rend the vaulted skies. Verse 10, you, are also, you, you also are all complete through your union with Christ. We stand complete in Christ. That is good news today. So Christ's triumph over these forces means that we don't need any additional religious practices to gain the favor or the power of God. Our focus should be on Christ and Christ alone, his finished work. Stay rooted in Christ. Avoid the deceptive teachings Reject the legalism and walk in Christ's victory. Amen? Father, I thank you that you paid it all through Jesus. I thank you that as we sang earlier, Lord, I need you. How we do need you. When I think about this journey and how easily people get swayed by all the different winds of teaching and doctrine and how we are to be vigilant, sober, to keep our eyes open as we wander through this jungle that is our walk, realizing that there are pitfalls along the way and that we, Lord, we need to be mindful of those things. And so I pray that you would help us to just have such a high view of Christ and his work that we would never fall into the trap that the enemy might set for us, that we would never uh, get wrapped up in the human philosophies, the empty human philosophies that come from human thinkings and the rudiments of the world, but all the things that were a shadow, I'm so thankful we have the real thing in Christ. I'm so thankful that all that reality was revealed in Christ Jesus. So help us to have such a high view of him that we'll never fall prey to that. And Lord, help us to guard ourselves against legalism when it comes to our own personal convictions, that we would not put on someone what we wouldn't want put on ourselves, and that we would understand that everything that needs to happen in order for me to be made right with you was done on the cross. Lord, and I simply just trust believe, and follow you. And so God, I pray that as we began our journey, we commence it in faith, that we would continue in faith, standing strong in the victory that has been secured for us in Christ Jesus. And it's his name I pray, amen.